Today our topic is youth unemployment. I would like to start by welcoming our young friends, David Jones, our moderator, and all those who are listening online. Today we have 75 million young people who are unemployed in the world today. They represent 40% of the global unemployed. And these are gruesome statistics. And it does indicate how difficult it is for young people in our world today. What can we do about this problem? What should governments do? What can the young people do? And what ideas do they have for their own future? We have a tendency often to discuss the problems of the youth without consulting them. But I believe we need to hear their views. We need to factor them in when the governments are taking decisions, when programs are being established for them. And today we want to offer the opportunity to the young ones, the leaders of tomorrow, to tell us how they see the problem and how together we can work to improve it. We don't want to accept a situation where a whole generation is lost and the long-term unemployment, that is people who've been out of job for over a year, is becoming a real problem and we need to tackle it and tackle it quickly. So there we are. Let me uh, ask before we get into the details, uh, I would first ask David to briefly explain the sequence and the purpose of today's uh, discussion. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Anan. Um, and I want to say I'm absolutely delighted. It's a great pleasure to moderate the second of the Kofi Annan dialogues on this critically important subject uh, of youth unemployment. Um, we're going to be a 90-minute broadcast in total. It will be divided into three sections. The first section is about the, the employment challenges and why so many young people are actually unemployed and actually looking at the issue and the problem. The second half of hour will be all about strategy and actions, so what is it that governments, that businesses, that individuals can do uh, to address and tackle this problem. And then during the last half hour, we'll be taking questions from social media. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag Kofi Annan Live. So that's hashtag Kofi Annan Live, which you can see on the screen. So please tweet us, post, send your questions and thoughts in. And then Mr. Annan will, will wrap up and conclude. Um, so there's also a poll taking place on the website. So please complete it so we can capture your views. Uh, and I think one of the amazing things we have not only the ability to listen to Mr. Nan's wisdom, but also he will take these thoughts and ideas and drive them to the key decision makers in the world. Um, so on that note, if the participants could introduce themselves very quickly, we have a fantastic and a brilliant group of young people. Uh, so starting with Sarah, would you, uh, and if all of you just do a quick introduction in one sentence, that would be great. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here today. I'm from the United States. My name is Sarah Little. I'm actually joining you, though, from Amman, Jordan, where I'm working with a nonprofit organization that works to address youth unemployment in the Middle East and North Africa. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Next up, we have Michael. Salam Sujatra, Vista Anand. My name is Michael Teosulim, and I'm a proud One Young World Ambassador from Malaysia. I'm an entrepreneur with an education business spread across 25 countries, harnessing the potentials of young people to succeed. And I sit on the boards of multiple NGOs and government organizations, both locally and globally. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having us here, Mr. Anand. Milenko. Milenko. Uh, hello, world. Uh, uh, my, my name is Milenko. Uh, I was born in uh, Bosnia, but for last six years I have been living in Greece. That's the reason why I have flag, and also our first investor in my Hey Success project is from Greece, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jan Angelopoulos, Athens Olympic CEO. And I'm a founder of a website heysuccess.com, which gathers all students' opportunity and show them that there is a future, that they are not lost generation, and that they can create their future but utilizing them. Thank you, Malenko. Wycliffe. Uh, 
Why, Cliff, you're on mute, so why don't we go across to Cedric whilst you take your line off you. So, Cedric. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Cedric. I'm 28 years old from Lebanon. I'm the Regional Director for the World Youth Alliance in the Middle East and North Africa, and also the Vice President of the Youth Economic Forum in Lebanon. And we recently worked on a policy brief on youth employment in the country, and I'm here to share what we learned from that experience. Then we have Esther from Spain and Matthew from the UK, who are both together in the UK. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Esther Botica. I'm from Spain, and I'm 28 years old. I'm managing different uh, projects to solve the unemployment uh, in Spain through the digital lit literacy. Um, hello, I'm Matthew. I'm 26 from London. I'm currently studying at Ruskin College in Oxford. Uh, Labour Movement College. Um, I'm a trade unionist and the student union president there and for most of my adult life I've been working in and around the trade union movement to ensure that young people typically employed in places um, with enormously bad working conditions, low pay uh, and huge exploitation are represented properly and fight back against the people who are um, doing this to them. Terrific and let's go back and try Wycliffe in Kenya. Hello, I'm Wycliffe. I'm from Kenya. I'm 27 years old. I'm the founder of Quito International, a nonprofit organization that helps youth who are homeless and living on the streets to become economically empowered through skills development and livelihoods. I'm really, really excited to be here today, and thank you so much, Mr. Anand. That's great. And then later, we hope that Lucia from Peru is going to be joining us and will replace Malenko, and that's going to happen for the second segment. Um, so let's get into the first segment and back to Esther, who's going to kick it off. Uh, Mr. Anand and the participants are going to explore employment challenges in their respective countries and address why so many young people are either already unemployed or at risk of not finding decent work. So Esther. Hello. Um, as everyone knows, uh, the, uh, eco the economic crisis in Spain has really impacted in youth unemployment. Uh, in that case, we have more than 50% of youth unemployment in my country in this moment. And one of the main challenges that we need to solve is how we can solve it and which uh, are the areas that we need to improve to solve that. Because we can see that politics, uh, NGOs, enterprise, they try to solve it, but it doesn't have uh, any, it, it happens, it, it, it seems that it has any solution. So that's the main challenge, and also because people are desperate to find a job, they try to emigrate to different countries, but I think that's not uh, the main solution to do that, because these people who are really well educated, and we are losing them. So. Mr. Anand, this is the main challenge we have. Wanting to immigrate and to leave. Are some of the young people thinking of creating their own companies if they can get the conditions like finance and other things and remain in Spain and work with others? Is that also happening? I think, yeah. It's happening more and more. The people is going to create new enterprise. They are self-unemployed. But um, I think the global downturn is had, it has hit it too much of Spain. Yeah. And it's quite difficult to have money from the banks to create it, this enterprise. And the people, people from the street, they, that they um, try to buy things and try to you know, generate economy. That's the problem. Right. We don't. We need to generate economy. Right, yeah. Okay, Matthew. Well, the main problem in our country, um, in terms of youth unemployment, is we have a government that is cutting off its nose to spite its face. Um, we have a, an education system uh, which has uh, less investment than any other OECD country um, in terms of the tripling of our tuition fees um, and funding cuts to subjects like humanities and social sciences. 
Uh, we've had the types of jobs that young, typically young people go into, um, like most countries, service service economy jobs. But with min the minimum wage across the board is consistently below inflation. But the economic crisis in particular has just meant the, the shedding of thousands upon thousands of jobs, especially particularly if you work in the public sector. And this is having a devastating effect. And anybody could have seen the root causes of the London riots two years ago. Hmm. Was the root causes, I believe, from unemployment. Hmm. Okay. And Cedric, how does it look in Lebanon in your area, in your country? Yeah, in Lebanon it's looking quite bad actually in terms of youth employment. Uh, as in uh, the other countries all over the world, youth, is, youth employment is, uh, um, unemployment is the highest among youth. However, the problem is uh, maybe less of job opportunities and more of uh, getting good job conditions. We have a large informal labor market. Around 65% of everyone working is not registered in Social Security and therefore do not benefit from any retirement plans or healthcare services, which has drastic social uh, problems on the long term. Uh, so this is a main problem we're facing and it's leading mainly to brain drain from the country. Uh, around 40% of uh, male graduates, university graduates, immigrate within five years of graduating and 20% of female graduates. When you say the, the graduates who come out of university and can't find jobs, how do you explain that? Is it because there's a mismatch between their skills and what is required or they are not given the right training to be able to function and find jobs outside the university walls? I think it's more of an issue of they're not finding jobs with uh, suitable working conditions uh, because university graduates expect to find a job that gives them uh, an equal return to what they have invested in their education. However, the jobs, uh, even for university graduates, are not well paid and they don't provide uh, any opportunities for personal development or career development and this is basically the main reason that's driving university graduates outside Lebanon. Uh, in Lebanon maybe anyone can find a waiter's job except the university graduate does not want to work as a waiter and that is the main problem. Mm -hmm. And Michael in Malaysia, let me ask you how things are there because there is a sense that whilst middle class is shrinking in the developed countries. They are expanding in the developing countries and jobs are being created at a rate faster than in the mature economies. Is that what you're seeing? I think Michael has actually just dropped off and so maybe we could move on to, uh, to the next person whilst we're getting Michael back. Okay. Uh, Milenko, let's hear from you. You are in Greece. It's a yeah. country that has also been hard hit by the financial and the economic crisis. How do you see the unemployment situation of the young people? <clears throat> yeah, as, a point, as you pointed out, uh, I don't need to explain more. It's more than 55% young people unemployed in Greece. So that's, those are big numbers. But actually the question uh, which changed my life and the reason why I'm talking to you today uh, was when I was in second year of studies and I asked myself what's the wrong with the system when so many graduates are graduating every year without any hope for, for future. As media say, they are the lost generation. Uh, from another side, there are so many opportunities. We are living in 21st century and young people can travel, can do internships, can start their own projects. So, as you pointed, at you, as you asked Seder, uh, you said, I believe that young people uh, are not prepared for real life, uh, they are not uh, equipped with uh, real life skills, because during the formal education they are forced to memorize stuff, memorize useless facts, and in one moment just throw them on the eggs of paper and forget them forever. So I believe that young people, uh, millions and millions of young people who graduate every year with empty CV and only with degree, I don't have uh, much chances to um, to to um, expect big things in their careers, but I believe that there is a hope. Or 21st century, one young world, give give us a hope, and I believe we can fight that very very well. Milenko, were you implying that you dropped out of university after your second year 
because you saw around you people with university degrees who were not getting jobs. And so you said to yourself, what's the point? Is that what you were trying to convey? Yeah, I, I didn't actually drop out, but that was the question which uh, uh, came on my mind. And for that reason, I traveled to over 20 countries and I uh, did research with about uh, 300 young people by asking them the questions, does the university really offer uh, real life skills? And all of them told me, you know, uh, just degree doesn't help in anything. You need to do much, much more other things. And we in his success.com are trying to do that. Yeah. Mr. Ann Michael is back. So if you wanted to ask the question to Michael again, he is now with us. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Ann. Hi, I wanted you to tell us about employment situation in your country, where economically it seems to be doing better. Middle Thank you. Expanding. And uh, you are considered one of the emerging prosperous countries. And I want to see what the situation is like compared to Spain or Greece. Thank you, Mr. Anand. And to everyone watching this live session right now, uh, Malaysia, we are progressing. We have been investing a lot into upskilling our youths also investing in a lot of volunteerism programs where we empower them with opportunity to learn skills, experiences and knowledge that would otherwise not be available through their formal education system in school, college and university. So much so that Mr. Anand and everyone watching this session right now, we are beginning to see an emerging breed of youth, youth that are not really interested in employment but rather they want to be in entrepreneurship they want to start their own business and because of that we tend to see a lot of youths technically being labeled unemployed but they are all aggressively starting up their businesses they are all kick-starting their ventures sourcing partnerships and resources so I think in Malaysia like in any other country we do have unemployment but we are progressing and we are creating a new trend, I would say, a new generation of more entrepreneurial youths. So, and I think one of the major problems why un unemployment still persists in my country, I would say, mainly I think we could see it from the youth's perspective. Are the youths being a little bit too demanding for salary expectations? Do they want employers to only listen to them and not vice versa? So I think it's a it's it's it goes vice versa. It goes both ways. But thank you again, Mr. Anand, and to everyone watching this session right now for recognizing the work that my country is doing. There's a lot more that can be done, and um, I'm more than happy to work with everyone, including at One Young World, to make that happen. Okay, Michael has raised a couple of a couple of issues here, which uh, should be of interest to all of us. First of all, he talked of training which also implies vocational training skills that uh, young people are being given and they walk into the marketplace with a can-do spirit that I want to establish my own company I'm not looking for a job but then of course to establish your own companies ideas are not enough you need financing you need advice and management what sort of structures are in place to help steer the young people in Malaysia, if it can be done in Malaysia, can it be replicated elsewhere? Let me now turn to Sarah. Sarah, what do you have to share with us? Sarah, are you there? Sarah, you appear to be on mute, actually. Beg your pardon. Sorry, David, you say something. Yes, Sarah, we can't hear Sarah, so I was just telling her I think her microphone is on mute if she wants to unmute it. All right, let's maybe we move on let's to, go to Wycliffe, I think. Wycliffe is the Wycliffe, how are things in Nairobi? Things are Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Things are things are good. It's cold. But we are we are well. You, you've heard your young other young friends share with us the situation of youth employment in their countries. I know youth unemployment is one of the big issues in Kenya. Tell me about some of the things that you've picked up and what is being done 
to try and address that issue. Right. <coughs> well, I think from uh, just listening to my other colleagues and listening about experiences in other countries in terms of youth unemployment, it's almost the sa similar here. But um, the new government is just rolling out uh, an initiative to provide youth with financing. But I think without the right skill, without the right training and skills that can really enable them to to set up small businesses or to set up companies that will eventually absorb other youth, it's it's still it's still a challenge. Um, but I would say that the biggest uh, impediment to employ to youth employment for us is the disconnect between the education system that mainly prepares people to look for jobs and they leave the campuses without the relevant experience to actually get those jobs. So when they apply for the job, they are told they require six years experience or three years experience and that really makes many graduates just stay out and uh, remain job seekers. Yeah. From the com discussions we've had in this brief period, what is, what is becoming clear is that sometimes people come out of universities and they cannot find jobs. Some have the courage to want to start their own jobs, their own businesses as entrepreneurs, but they need help, they need finance. And of course, on the job market, when the financial crisis struck or economic crisis struck, the young people were the first to let go on the basis often they do not belong to the unions and maybe Matthew will say something about this later. They are not union members, uh, they ha don't have seniority and ionically often they are the ones with the computer skills to be able to help the company but they are the first uh, to let uh, go. And this is where the question of do you l go around looking for jobs which do not exist? or you band together and say, what can we do? How can we create our own employment? How can we form committees, keep ourselves busy and bring others on board? Who wants to step in here? Matthew, uh, you may want to say something about yeah. the tra tra trade, union, trade union aspect and its impact on, on youth. Employment. Um, Okay, um, um, absolutely. I mean, if you look um, when this government, our government, um, the, the coalition between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats were elected in 2010, the very first people to show resistance to austerity, or as someone else called it the other day, planned poverty in this country, were students. And this was a student movement which had hundreds of thousands of students on the streets against the tripling of tuition fees. Uh, this led to within 22 votes of the governing coalition um, backing down over tripling of tuition fees. What that did though was completely show, as you're completely right, it showed up the trade unions for being completely lagging behind where young people were seeing that they were suffering, which was the, their education system, let alone the opportunities, not for, I, get net, I guess, for entrepreneurship, but just actually to be able to go out and get a job and have some dignity in your, in like in your working day. Um, where the trade unions in particular have failed is that they've been, they've been on in the decline for, um, for a couple of decades now. They have shown signs over the last couple of years of picking up, taking seriously the issues of employing students who work and people uh, taking on apprenticeships and taking on um, people particularly on low wages in, in, the, in those kind of like large supermarket service economy jobs. But they're nowhere near enough what they used to be. They aren't the old fashioned image in our, in our country in particular of being rows and rows of industrial housing where everybody knew everyone else, they were all in the union because they all worked in the same factory. Um, we can only hope that, the, the, to me, the, the problem with youth, youth unemployment isn't the entrepreneurial spirit. If you, wish to get, if you wish to start a business in Western Europe, you're in a fantastic position to do so. Other than the banks not being able to lend you as much money as they might have done pre-2008 in terms of for small business startups, it's a wonderful. You've got the lowest corporation tax rate in, in Europe if you're really going to progress your company that far. What it is, is that wages are stagnant. Conditions in places where, where people do work, though not as bad as other countries, isn't very good at all. And this is, the, this is the place where we really need to be focusing on because with it, without that, those entrepreneurial spirits won't, won't really go anywhere because you won't have people with the disposable income to be able to spend things on what entrepreneurship, um, entrepreneurs, sorry, are offering. Mr. Anand, I think Cedric yeah. had his hand up. 
Cedric, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Anand. Well, uh, you asked us offline to be as honest as possible, and so I will uh, do that, creating some controversy in the process. Uh, I would like to agree with the, the points uh, mentioned by Milenko on uh, uh, young people graduating from universities and lacking some basic uh, professional skills. This is a, an experience we always go through here, whether at the World Youth Alliance or the Youth Economic Forum, where I have people who are actually uh, more qualified than I am, academically speaking, however, if they can't try to report or uh, read a, an action plan, for example, it makes it difficult to actually hire them and therefore they barely apply for internship positions. Uh, however, the question is, uh, is offering them uh, skills actually creating job opportunities? Because if we offer them the skills to get jobs, in the end they're going to get these jobs at the expense of other people who are of, who are older than they are. So in the end we're not really creating jobs and that's my opinion on the matter. And so here I would go back to what Esther said uh, with regard to the economy. So Esther talked about the economy and how we need actually a prospering economy in order to create job opportunities for both young and uh, older people. Uh, and then entrepreneurship can be a solution. Uh, it can be a solution for young people. However, something to note is also in entrepreneurship do all young people have uh, the skills to create their own businesses, to create their own entrepreneurship uh, enterprise in terms of management, in terms of uh, marketing? Uh, do they have the enough skills not to fail? Because we don't want to set them up in uh, new businesses and then having them fail in the end because that's worse than being unemployed. Uh, so the question is how, can, how much can entrepreneurship actually absor absorb out of uh, the youth unemployment uh, uh, problem. And the last comment is uh, with regard to the trade unions. Trade unions in a lot of developing countries, including Lebanon, trade unions are not really effective at all. In Lebanon, they're highly politicized, and so the role is uh, not really the role of a trade union as, uh, as uh, traditionally thought. Thank you. No, uh, th thank you, Cedric. You've raised a couple of uh, issues here. First, the type of training people get in these institutions before they go on to the job market. Is that the skills the companies and the, and the market is looking for? Or sometimes they go to get a degree with, uh, without any relevance to what the market needs. And this is where the question of skills, vocational training, training on the job, and other things become relevant. You are right that in this age of austerity, the economy is not expanding as quickly as it could. And if young people were to set up their own companies, they would need financing, they would need management advice, marketing, and others. And there must be systems in place to help them do this. And, and of course, the impact of uh, entrepreneurial activity is that is the small and medium-sized companies that create jobs. They create more jobs than the bigger companies. You know, so if you had young people setting up small, medium-sized companies that are sustained because they have financing, they have support, they will be able to create jobs for themselves and, and for others. And so we shouldn't dismiss that. But of course, that's not enough. We will go, come to this later. The government has a role to play and even the corporations. I think that's a nice answer to one of the, the tweets that we got, Mr. Anand, um, from actually somebody called Kofi Yeboah from Ghana, and his point was, do you agree that the educational system is one of the main causes of the high unemployment rate? David, is, I'm glad you emphasized this point, because you also have situation, we have the other extreme, where people with good education, good background, technical skills, who've gone to school and done it, who can't find jobs, and they also don't understand it. That I was told to go and get education, I've got myself into debt to get university education, MBA or whatever, and I'm still unemployed. And that leads to even greater frustration. Have any of you encountered young people in that situation? I think Sarah has her hand up. Sarah, Sarah, go ahead.
Sarah, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute again. Try again, or if not, we'll go to somebody else. Sarah, you, you, you're okay. Sarah can still, still can't get through. Who else wants to say something on this issue? Malenko. Milenko? Yeah, uh, I want to add something because we were talking about skills, about gaining practical skills, and I absolutely agree that university and formal education doesn't offer real life skill. But there is one worse thing uh, than skills is uh, imagine uh, 100 uh, million young people graduating every year in the same way, in the studying in the same way, getting degree which doesn't have a, in the background real life experience and all the media telling you that you are lost generation, that you are living in a, in a situation of economic crisis, that you don't have a future. So in that way, self-confidence of young people is destroyed. I think that that, that fact is the, the worst in, in all the formal education uh, system. And I just want to add one uh, small remark to uh, Cedric when he said uh, if they don't uh, if, then, if they don't achieve in starting their own business. That's not a problem. Uh, if they fail, they will learn much more things than uh, by, uh, by trying uh, than, than if they didn't start the business. So I think that young people should just start in the main challenges, overcome challenges to become uh, much more skilled and to build their self-confidence in that way. Good. I think I have a uh, Esther, you wanted to uh, say something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think one of the main problems related with the graduate people, uh, with the non-graduate people, is that we think there are first-class jobs and second-class jo class jobs. I think we should have stopped thinking that because it can be that an electrician is going to earn much more than a doctor. because. It's true that maybe we don't need every year 20,000 engineers. So it's something that it should be related with the beliefs and with the, what we want, how we want a country. We cannot, uh, I mean, it's, it's an education problem. Maybe we should stop creating doctors, teachers, biologists, and they should go more to a vocational training that is as good as, good as the other way. Yeah, at least that will give you a skill to yeah. be able to operate. Matthew? Um, I mean, it's, it's, quite Matthew. It's, it's quite a fascinating discussion because I, th I, don't, I don't think it's just skills in terms of a, a, a root end for you just to get a job. Education isn't just also just for young people, though it's concentrated there. There is a complete lack of, um, lack of investment from, from states and from industry into lifelong learning, which is something our college in Oxford does, which is get people from every age from 80 down to 20 to do. And if you're not going to have like lifelong investment in education, and you're also not just going to focus on these, relatively speaking, small sections of the economy of startup entrepreneurial businesses and start to look at the investment in environmental jobs coming from the state and the democratic institutions, then I think you're really going to miss, I think, the point of how we're going to really tackle the undercurrent of youth unemployment. Mm. Yeah, I think we, we also have to understand that the uh, objective of education is to prepare us for life, not necessarily for uh, immediately for a specific job. It gives us um, a sense of what, what kind of world we live in, uh, how to analyze situations, how to think out way through issues, and it gives us certain basic skills which we require. But of course, there's also then what you need to be able to uh, get the job done and stay on the job. The governments have a responsibility, but I hope some of the companies would also say that we need to help train the people that we, we, we the workers we need, and we would take X number of graduates, X number of young people who are coming out of high school and put them through this program and employ them after uh, they have come out of the program. Are you seeing some of that in your communities? Y y yes, uh, Michael. Was Michael. that Michael? Michael, yes. Michael, yes. 
this. Yes, Mr. Anand, thank you very much. I agree with all my colleagues have uh, said about uh, unemployment and what are the causes. So I'd like to bring our attention where we cannot blame the educational system per se. The education system would provide the best setting to make a talent employable, entrepreneurial. But I think right now we have to ask the question, are our young talents these days demanding a little bit too much? They're, they're, they're looking too much for the high side while not being able to prove their worth or their capabilities. And I think much more opportunities should be given, should be tested among our young people to, for them to discover their weaknesses while they're still studying so that they can enhance their strengths, hence be more attractive for employment. I think that's key number one. Key number two, I agree with my colleague uh, Malinko, where uh, being involved in entrepreneurship train one's talent to be more entrepreneurial, which is a trait that I would say most organizations look for in terms of attracting a highly resourceful, a highly proactive talent to add value to their work. So I believe it's not fair to just blame the education system. I think we have to look for ourselves in ourselves as youths to see how we too can contribute. So, um, Mr. Anand, we're going to have to uh, ask Milenko to leave us shortly. And as we move to the second section, I wondered if, he, if we wanted to give him the opportunity to say a final word in the in the first section. Yes, and this moment. Uh, except of thanking you for this amazing experience, I want to send uh, two special uh, uh, regards. Uh, first is to the most amazing youth generation which has ever lived on the earth. Uh, we are lucky because we were born in the 21st century. We have so many opportunities. Just ignore what media are telling to you, what uh, your professors are telling to you. Grab your opportunities and you are the most amazing you are going to achieve amazing things. Regardless where you were born, what's your family background, that's not that's not important. And I want to also to send special greetings to Hey Success, my Hey Success volunteers from all over the world. They are also amazing. And thank you thank, thank very you, much. You, you've left us with some inspiration. Thank you very much. And thank uh, you have a good day. Bye bye. And let's bye -bye. welcome Lucia. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Milenko. And we're now going to bring in uh, Lucia. <coughs> She'll be coming in. Are there any final observations, Mr. Anand, as, before we move on to segment two? Yeah, I, I think we've had a very good discussion on this segment where everyone is making it clear that the young people want, to, want employment, they want jobs. Some come out of university and institu educational institutions ready to be employed. Others go out and create their own companies. And obviously, the rules of uh, trade unions differ from country to country. But what is important is that the individual also sees in himself or herself that ability to be able to strike out on their own and, and push the limits and see what they can do for themselves. And the fact that it's not easy to just start a company, you need finance, you need management advice, and you need uh, marketing, and hopefully there will be systems in place to support young people when they set up these, these companies. So let's move on to the next segment of our thing. David, anything you wanted to say? No, I thought that was fascinating. I think actually there's just a, a, a tweet that I thought was quite interesting from Evan Kaplan that says, youth should not fear failure, we will fail. How we respond to failure is much more important. And I thought that was a, a very pertinent tweet. Um, and if we can just have a quick hi from Lucia, who I think has now joined us. Good morning, Mr. Anand and everyone. I am Lucia Valencia Dongo. I am 23 and I come from Peru, Latin America. I consider myself of an entrepreneur and uh, last year I co-founded a startup called Duem which is a platform that connects socially conscious consu consumers with responsible brands and products. I really look forward to joining this conversation. W welcome on board Lucia, we are happy to have you uh, with us and uh, I, I suspect you were able to listen to the first segment of yes. the discussion and uh, we now move to the next segment which uh, uh, David indicated would deal with um, uh, the 
uh, uh, strategies. David, that's right. And we, we, we it is indeed. We're going, we're going to ask, I think, Sarah to kick off. And um, this section is all about okay, so we, we've talked and, and looked at the issues and the problems. What are the strategies, the actions? What can government do? What can business and the private sector do? And what can individuals do at both a local and global level? Yeah, and what they can all do together too in partnership. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, my, one of my favourite quotes of yours is, "If if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together." <laughs> Good. Okay, who who wants to start? Sarah, what are the strategies? Sarah, go ahead. I hope we can hear you this time. Mm. Oh gosh. That's frustrating That's for you, Sarah. Sarah, try, try again. Are you on mute? Just give it one more chance. If not, we'll go to somebody else. Yeah. Still no, no sound. It was working earlier. Let's, why don't we go to somebody else? Who else would like to make a comment? Wycliffe, is that your hand up? Yes, it is. Wycliffe. Yes. Okay. Great. Go ahead, Rycliffe. Thank you, Mr. Anand. I, I think that one of the strategies, uh, looking, looking from the Kenyan perspective, one of the barriers to youths uh, setting up something or, or actualizing the ideas is, is financing. And this is because there are so many restrictions from uh, MFIs and banks that really are barriers to youth accessing the necessary capital for them to start to set up their businesses or to actualize the ideas, the innovative ideas that they have. So one way is to, 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 for those institutions to develop youth-friendly products that really uh, youths can not necessarily very easily access, but can be very accessible to the youth. Most of the youth who are in the informal settlements, like uh, where I work in, we are, there's a very large group of youth that is unemployed, but if you talk to them, they, they have really brilliant business ideas, but where is the capital? They go out there and they can't access it. The government set up a youth fund a few years ago, and still accessing it has been our challenge because it was given to banks to disperse it. So relaxing the restrictions and the conditions and the requirements for the youth can, can help, in, can be one way of helping. Capital is always uh, an important question for new inter entrepreneurs, and to it's not everywhere in the world that you have uh, venture capitals, uh, capitalists who are prepared to put up money. But sometimes in these situations, you can set up a cooperative where a group can come together and try and uh, either starting with their own savings and uh, approach a bank to try and, and get a loan. I heard of a fascinating uh, project in Kenya where, you, I, I don't know if you've heard about it, it was called Rent a Cow, Re Rent a Cow, where an NGO came together, they banded together as an NGO, and, and uh, the farmers had more cows than they can milk. So one can rent the cow, milk uh, the cow, take the milk to a station, deposit it there, get the money, and split it with the owner of the cow. And I'm told that NGO has about 250,000 people in that group, that sort of a cooperative. And there are lots of creative ways uh, one can band together. And when you have that sort of organization, I think the banks will probably listen to you. I know sources of capital is a problem in Kenya and in Africa. But there may be other ideas others can share with you. Who wants to go next? Y yes, Cedric. Great, thank you, Mr. Anand. Uh, first of all, I'm glad, I'm glad uh, when I talked about youth failing, it triggered a lot of reactions. So it shows that youth are really willing to push. And something I uh, encourage everyone to do is just try something out. If it doesn't work, try something else. Uh, in response, well, I'd like to also uh, mention something we something that's not really traditionally considered as a policy to tackle youth employment. So we talk a lot about a lot about entrepreneurship, uh, but we don't talk a lot about freelance work. 
uh, a lot of our university graduates actually do freelance work in the informal sector uh, to, to gain some uh, side money in the process but also to gain some expertise uh, within their field of education uh, so maybe a solution that we can look into is more formalizing uh, the freelance sector and uh, you talked about you gave the example of uh, in Kenya and maybe we can pull the skills of freelancers together where we can access one place and uh, actually get the skills of several freelancers who charge less than traditional companies for their know-how which is also an opportunity for small and medium-sized enterprises who do not have a lot of uh, money to pay for example for design skills uh, for, for basically the know-how that people receive at university and who can access this group of freelancers and therefore we can create some job opportunities uh, offer these freelancers some experience and cover that gap of around five years from graduation until uh, really getting the experience you need to either find a long-term job or create your own business, create uh, your own entrepreneurship uh, uh, idea. How many people can you take on like that? How many people can participate in that program? Well, first, first of all, you need the government policies in place to, uh, to have the freelance uh, business become uh, formal in the sense that uh, you need to have the systems in place for them to actually pay for uh, taxes, for their income tax, but that would be, uh, well, we're talking about giving them, giving them some uh, reductions within the tax, but uh, also offer the, offering them some uh, social security because freelance work doesn't offer you any social security in that sense. Uh, it's like working uh, in the firm, uh, illegal, an illegal job right now in Lebanon, and I'm sure, uh, and also in many other countries. So apart from the skills that freelancers need to manage their own financing, to know how to set up a quotation, for example, uh, to know how to talk to clients, they also need the policies in place, uh, the legal system in place to allow them to uh, work as freelancers and also have their work uh, formally recognized. Good. That, that is a very helpful input. And obviously, governments can set up systems and offer incentives that could encourage companies to take on young people, take on trainees, and help them uh, uh, during the lean periods until the economy picks up and they can move on to other things. But I'll be, I'll be happy if some of you can also share with us specific programs that you know of that has generated youth employment or is encouraging creation of jobs either by existing companies, by the young people themselves, or where governments have come up with programs that encourages youth employment, or government and companies have come together to push. Yeah. Yes, is that Sarah? Okay, let's try again. Let's try Sarah again. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's great, I just switched to a different headset. It's, it's great to be with you all, and it's been a great conversation so far. Um, I wanted to share with you an example, actually, of the organization where I've been working, Education for Employment, because exactly what we do is connect the educational system and the private sector companies and government ministries together in the countries where we work to solve problems of youth unemployment and create jobs. So we, we start actually by working with private sector companies and finding out what their needs are and what sorts of um, and skills that they're looking for in new employees. Because we found in a lot of the countries throughout the Middle East and North Africa where we work that actually there are jobs available at private sector companies, but they can't find youth who are qualified to fill them. So we start by working with these companies and we find out what skills they need and we design training programs that exactly match those skills and that are tailor-made for the companies and in return they pre-commit to hire the graduates of the training program. So we've been training graduates in six countries throughout the Middle East now in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, and Yemen and to be placed in jobs with these private sector companies and we've also simultaneously been working with public educational institutions and also with government ministries 
to start the programs on a larger scale. So for example, in Morocco, we formed a partnership with the Ministry of Youth and Sports to access the youth centers that they have all throughout the kingdom of Morocco and to reach a larger number of youth in um, both urban areas and rural areas throughout the country. And they've been um, pushing to, to implement this type of programming on a larger scale throughout the country. And we've also been working with public educational systems to make sure that youth are equipped with the skills they need to get and keep a job. So it's, we found it's not just technical skills. Youth might have skills in accounting or engineering or something like that to be able to do the technical work of a company, but they don't have proper career education early on. They aren't sure how to write a cover letter or a resume, and they don't have interview skills. They might not know how to find search and find jobs that they're qualified for. So we're working with educational systems, both high schools and universities and youth centers throughout the countries, to actually get the, the youth to have career education early on so that they're better equipped to find a job when they graduate. And I think that this sort of model of working on all levels with private sector companies, with governments, and with public educational institutes is really a good example of a type of solution that can help um, find job opportunities for youth, place them, and also help the private sector with finding qualified employees that can help them grow as well. Sarah, let me ask you a question. Are, are your participants, the young people, are they high school graduates or from high school through university? And if it's high school through university, do you have situations where some young people believe this is beneath them, they are better qualified and they deserve better jobs and they wouldn't even consider what you are offering? That's a very good question. And we work with a wide range of youth, some of whom are university graduates, others of whom are high school graduates or even high school dropouts. It depends on the country and the needs of the employer. Um, in the case of university graduates, we have found that sometimes they might feel that certain fields are not, are a bit beneath them perhaps. They aren't as interested in going into vocational jobs and working in factories or doing um, electrical maintenance work or something like that. And it's a social stigma that our organization has been trying to overcome and teaching youth that there are jobs available which are very reasonable jobs where they can make a good living and that it's not a social shame to take these sorts of positions. And while also trying to make sure that we are getting youth jobs that are good, that are not exploitative, and where they are able to earn a good living for themselves and their families and become independent, productive contributors of society. Yeah. I, I think Sarah has put an interesting project on the table where, in effect, a government or a, an organization can approach companies, hopefully even sector by sector. You can approach people in the uh, uh, tourism industry and say, we will help work with you to train people in the industry, or go to the oil industry and say, let's work to get welders trained or other people in the industry and bring a group of companies together, working with the government or a, a civil society organization to push ahead on, on that uh, uh, basis. I think Michael wanted to say something. Michael? Michael. Thank you, Mr. Anand. Just to share with you what our government here, especially through the Ministry of Human Resources, have done. Now, for every employer that subscribes to this special program, we call it a, a, a grant matching program, where they actually have their staffs, whether it's young or old, contribute a certain percentage or portion of their salary towards a collective fund that will then be matched by the government agencies so that these employees can then be retrained from an annual basis. Now from my observation, this basically makes the younger talent force more relevant to the changing tides because right now organizations need not worry about blowing we up their my, bottom line. Let me go back to you. Sorry, you're back. Oh, yes. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Anna. So what I was saying was um, this fund that is collected and which is matched by other grants by the government with the company would allow the company to not worry about blowing their bottom line by investing in the education of their staffs. And personally, what I've seen is that this really helped the younger staff keep up to date with the skills, the experiences that they would need to be relevant in the job market. So I think a solution right here is government could incentivize, they could actually match grants with companies to actually send their employees for retraining, for further enhancement of the skills in order to keep them motivated, to keep them relevant and to keep them in trend with the demands of the industry. That's a little strategy right there, Mr. Anand. Would any of you have advice, advice for Wycliffe when he raised the question of if a young person wants to set up a company, how does he get the finance, how does he get the advice he needs, whether on management, on uh, marketing and other skills. So you, you have experiences uh, to share. I'll come back to you, Michael, but let me try uh, some of the others. Lucia, Lucia's got a hand up. Lucia? Um. Yeah, uh, Latin America is a region of entrepreneurs. I have the experience of creating a startup last year in a developing country. So I would say that one of the best ways to tackle youth unemployment is uh, promoting a new generation of socially conscious and innovative entrepreneurs. For example, here in Peru, there are some b private uh, business accelerators which give the money, the mentorship, and also the network to young people so they can develop their innovative ideas and projects in a developing country. This year, the Peruvian government is starting Startup Peru, which will be a public accelerator which, which will give grants to more than 100 innovative projects all over Peru. I believe there are many business accelerators in many countries and we must promote the creation of more of them so they can support these innovative uh, projects and give venture capital to highly risky innovative projects also. Would they review their projects uh, in order for them to qualify for the accelerator money? Yes. Yes. For example, in, in my situation, there were more than 1,300 projects and we were only selected 10. So you have to pass through a, through a selection process. I, I understand that the same will be with the government, but the government will be like 200 grants per year. So that's better. very much. Um, I, I think uh, I'll go to Esther and then to Michael again. No. Esther, yeah. you, you, you have your hand yeah. up. I think that's a really good point that Lucia has arrived, that this is our governments. What are the governments doing? Because what I see in Spain is that there, are an austerity, and there is an austerity politics. So what does it mean? They mean a lot of people is working for the government, but when they retire, there are a lot of posts that they are not covered. So what is happening? The more and more people that was working for the government, they cannot work anymore. There are a lot of people that cannot find a job even in the in the, in the public post. So I think it will, the government should also encourage to be an entrepreneur, like in the case of Peru. Yes. Um, I think Lucia has a hand up. David, hand. David, help me there. Who has? Who is it? <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things just from social media. Then I think Lucia has a hand up. But um, the uh, Enrique Barbosa has said in in return to the uh, in, in line with the question on financing, she said Kickstarter and other crowdfunding tools are an important way to get around the problem of youth financing, which I thought was quite interesting. And then talking about austerity, Sofia Del Palaccio has said, you know, the main problem here is the lack of investment in education and the lack of resources for new entrepreneurs. Austerity will not solve any of those problems. So I thought two interesting and pertinent comments that have been tweeted. And I think Lucia, you have your hand up, do you not? Yes. Um, I wanted to say that it's not only a government responsibility, but also it needs to be a joint effort between the government, the private sector, universities, and the youth. The private sector is really important because they have the knowledge and the experience to mentor and support these, these young entrepreneurs. And universities must give the knowledge 
and they must also promote um, these practice-oriented study programs. So the uh, students finish university having this more experience and having an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, for example, here in Peru, when you study medicine, you need to go uh, after you, you finish the career, you need to work one year in some rural area of the country. The government gives you some money, and with this experience you gain, with this experience you gain also, uh, well, experience, and you facilitate the education work transition. I believe these kind of programs should work with all careers. Um, and I, will, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Kofi Annan, what public policies we need to, to do to, to put these kind of programs in, in different countries, especially in developing countries? No, I, I think we, we all have to learn from each other. And when we discover something that works, not only should we encourage it to be replicated, but we should also scale it up. I would also want to say from the discussions we've had that universities should play a role. Educational institutions and universities must be concerned about problems of society and they should work with society to find solutions to some of the challenges that we, we face. And I hope we can encourage universities in our countries to take on the issue of youth unemployment and to come up with approaches and strategies that will help put the youth back to work and really uh, help us avoid a situation where we will be talking of a lost uh, generation. Michael, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Anand. Just to share one of the strategies that has been done here in Malaysia, we have a one-stop center where pretty much for those who are interested to launch an entrepreneurial venture, you have the funding agents there, the banks there, the loans, you have the training facilities there, you have the business writing clinics there, so it's all in a one-stop center. Also, this one-stop center also plays its role as a hiring hub where pretty much graduates who are looking for work, uh, they can actually go there, look for jobs, be hired into an SME, be hired into businesses. So I think creating a physical hub in every single state or every single county or community would help a lot. It will be a one-stop center. If people want to get loans for entrepreneurship, they can go there. Or people want to get employment, they can go there as well. Just sharing, Mr. Anand. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I think, uh, Matthew, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just um, maybe very much on a different tone because I don't suppose entrepreneurship is really my 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 forte as such. But I think one of the things underlining all of um, all of these issues in the economy, and particularly in in the British economy and in Western European economies, is there's no demand there. As um, Mr. said quite rightly, this, the austerity means that uh, you've seen so dramatically cut in Spain, for instance, as it has been. Um, in Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and places that when you when they're looking for the private sector to soak them up, their jobs aren't necessarily coming because the growth hasn't hasn't got there. So when because the growth isn't there and the private sector is only incrementally coming, when the private sector moves into these areas, and I think in terms of our education system and to go back into different projects we're running, you can look in in our country, for instance, in Sussex. University in Warwick University at the moment in different disparate places all over the country. You've had stu you've had places where the marketization of education and the privatized edu privatization of education has meant mass course closures, mass department closures because they want to slimline it because they, they there is a singular fundamental concern when they're taking on such a such a huge area of the public sector. That is the bottom line. That's to make cash and that is to take take labor and make something at the end of it. And I, I think there's a, a really, really big danger here if we're looking solely quite at the at the micro level and right right down to the taproot level of people, you're missing out on the actually what privatization, marketization and the the enhancement of entrepreneurship within to the public sector is gonna do and it's gonna hurt people. It has hurt people. It will hurt people even more on a deeper level and you will find what happens in Turkey and Brazil will just explode up in different places again. No, I, I, I think uh, the, we, we, we are all conscious of what uh, austerity programs has done and what is difficult is everybody is cutting at the same time. You know, uh, your, your, uh, as uh, Paul Kruger puts it, your expenditure is my income, my expenditure is your income. If we are both not spending, how does anyone 
get an income and move on. I'm one of those who believes that uh, on this question of austerity, one has to be moderate in the short term to the longer term and then be disciplined in the long term to get the public finances right. And I think the debate that is going on in Europe seems to be moving towards easing of the austerity programs that we have uh, seen. And I think that will be very positive for ev everybody. But the governments also have to come up with approaches that encourages the banks and the companies to, uh, to lend money. I mean, today you have corporations sitting on about, according to the ILO study, $6 trillion, which are building up cash, paying dividends, buying back stocks, but they are not investing. They are not uh, giving the money up for productive uh, investments. And all this can change if the governments were to come up with the right incentives and approaches to uh, get them out. But uh, the, the question of access to funding, the question of uh, encouraging entrepreneurship, you, you f focused on uh, 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 privatization. Of course, there are those who believe in economic stimulus, which uh, US has done, not so much in Europe, but is being discussed. Japan is trying it, and we will see uh, what happens. But l let's continue. I shouldn't. Mr. Anand, um, we're, we're probably going to bring the second section to a, a close. What I was just interested in uh, a quick question from me, if I may. Obviously, um, I do two things I run a charity, but I'm also a CEO. And, you know, business is clearly a key uh, solution driver in the. In, fixing this issue, what would your message be to the CEOs of the world around this critical issue of youth employment? I, I would um, uh, encourage them uh, to have um, faith in the youth. I would encourage them to understand that if we do not give the young today of today an opportunity, we are creating a situation where we may lose a whole generation. The longer an individual is out of the job market, the much more difficult it is for them to get back into it. And I would encourage them to take some risks, uh, to be creative in offering traineeship, tra uh, vocational training of sorts, and in some cases even offering finance to uh, encourage their suppliers and small and medium-sized companies to be set up. And uh, uh, the tendency today has been to build up cash. I, I wish they would begin to ease up a little bit and, mm. and invest in, uh, in, in productive uh, areas. So have confidence in the youth, give them a chance, and they will surprise you. Great advice. Would you have any final comments on this second section before we take some uh, from comments and issues from social media? I think I've been quite impressed by the determination of our, uh, our young friends to ensure, to see that um, uh, jobs are created, the young people are engaged, and they would not only want to look for jobs, they would want to have an opportunity to create their own companies uh, for themselves and also for others. What is important is to find a way of working with government, civil society, and other financial institutions to ensure that the support systems that we need, support in terms of finance, management, advice, marketing, is available to move these young entrepreneurs uh, forward. So I would encourage you to keep it up and don't lose hope. I think for one of the, the comments from uh, social media sort of sums it up from Laura Kanga. She says, there's a need for concrete actions. We need to see concretely what are the contribution of governments and companies. And I think well, it was great, some of the very tangible, concrete examples that, that have been raised. So if we go to social media for five or ten minutes now, um, uh, Henrique Barbosa has a question. So Mr. Anand, what do you think about establishing a paper and pulp industry in Ghana to create job opportunities and reduce the bill of ordering, for example, toilet paper from overseas and other simple things such as toothpicks. 
obviously is 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 good for any society to be able to produce what it needs i've often um uh, criticize uh, african countries that we produce what we don't eat like cocoa and export and import what we eat if if <laughs> if we can <laughs> reverse it and this is why we are now very focused on agricultural transformation and whatever we can produce locally will help the local economy. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, pulp will be uh, uh, on the top of my agenda. And a, a second question which I think is quite interesting. Um, is part of the problem the loss of the relationship between employer and employee and viewing employees as human resources? I think there are, there are several uh, different models. I mean, there are those who say it as up down uh, e employees as human resources or employees as members of the family, that we are all one family working with, on one mission, one goal, and we share the benefits that comes from the uh, enterprise. And I think uh, uh, that approach usually is, is much better in the sense that it generates loyalty and uh, people come to work happy knowing that the benefits would also be, be, be shared by them. But of course today there's a question of uh, the distribution of benefits between capital and labor. That is, labor really is being squeezed out and it's not getting as much of the benefits as capital is. Um Lawrence Waring says, or Waring says, that the ILO says that 200 million people are unemployed globally, 73 million of them are young people, but over a billion of those earn less than $1.25 a day. Uh, and the question is, isn't poorly paid work worse than no work? An interesting, interesting question. It, it is an interesting uh, dilemma. I think both are a problem. Uh, if uh, someone has skills and is ready to work, can't create his or her own company and can't find an employment is frustrating, is demeaning, and uh, it, it can lead to other tensions. But the, uh, the other side where people have to work to live, and in fact almost 80% of what they earn a day or 75 goes towards food, is, is a terrible uh, problem also and demeaning uh, situation. And that's one of the reasons why uh, with the Millennium Development Goals, the whole world agreed will try and eliminate, eliminate extreme uh, poverty so that you don't have that kind of situation. So both situations are a problem and it affects individuals uh, differently. Very good. And then we have, a, we have a, a question which I think will be one that's close to your heart from Baobab Sprinter. Mr. Anand, do you think that ecotourism and the green economy can contribute towards jobs? I, I think it, it can. I mean, there are economists who will tell you that uh, the, uh, the greening of the economy can create jobs. And in fact, some go as far as saying it could have an impact as important as the Industrial Revolution had, that if we had to green the economy and re rethink the way we exploit the resources of the world, we will create uh, quite a lot of jobs. We will create quite a lot of jobs for, for everyone. Uh, obviously, there will have to be a lag. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lag period. Today, when you look at uh, robots, for example, where people believe they are taking over jobs of people and putting people out of jobs. Down the line, we may be able to see other benefits that will allow creation of many more jobs than it is apparent today. But there is a sense that the greening of the economy will be helpful and not negative. That's great. We hope so. Um, yes. John in London has said, in all countries, women are more likely to be unemployed no matter their age. Why concentrate just on youth unemployment? Oh, oh, I agree with that, that we need to concentrate on youth unemployment and women's uh, unemployment. We need to remove the impediments that are put in the way of women uh, getting into the job market, getting into positions of leadership, and not being paid 
uh, fairly in, compa com in comparison with their male colleagues. And so we need to uh, pay attention to that as well. It's not a problem I would ignore or would recommend that we ignore. And um, uh, societies that have used the talent, full talent of their women have done much better than those which have not. No, it's a very good point. Um, a question of something you're obviously a, a major expert in from uh, David Sivevuku. How can the UN help countries in reducing illiteracy and, and acquiring skills and thereby reducing poverty and improving employment? I, I don't know if the UN can help directly, but they have tried to encourage literacy, health, uh, investments in health, uh, uh, realizing that it, uh, a nation needs healthy, productive workers to be able to uh, move on. But we do it by encouraging each government to set up its own national strategy on how to improve education, health, and the well-being of, of their people. And quite a few countries have embraced this approach and have their national strategies which they share with the people so that the people can also follow development and put pressure on the governments to deliver what they have promised to do. And then one more uh, question, and then I think we'll ask the, the participants for some closing remarks before you give your own closing remarks, Mr. Anand. But do you think there is a danger of a disindustrial revolution in that if you look at the social media companies today, you know, people like Facebook run a billion users but only have 5,000 employees. People like Instagram have 140 million users but only have 32 employees. Is there a danger that the, the new digital and social revolution is not actually creating mass employment in the way the industrial revolution did? Uh, that is uh, observation of many that um, uh, we, we have technology, we have time-saving devices uh, which um, uh, puts people out of work. I mean, when you go to certain countries today uh, on question of take even household chore like mowing the grass, today you have robots that will do, they will mow all day if necessary, and you don't need individuals. And you replicate this in many areas, you, you have a problem. And the question then is what, what alternative activities is coming on stream for the people who have been uh, put out, out of job. This is one of the challenges of, of, of our, our time. And this is where the, the, the question of greening of the economy and having the different ways of uh, uh, handling the economy and energy and others may be able uh, to, to help us create uh, jobs. But I think apart from the uh, technology companies, you know, over the last 10, 20 years, when we look at the uh, global economy, that we have had lots of investments in financial instruments in this and that and that, but in the productive areas and productive investments, sometimes we've had, we haven't had as much. And we need to really direct investment into productive areas. And I think also we learn something for the, from the financial crisis that we are suffering from is a packaging of these financial areas where the financial sector became so big, but the productive and other areas were, were, were shrinking. And I hope we'll find a way of going the other direction and also creating jobs and making people uh, uh, active again. Terrific. Maybe we should ask some of our participants for their final comments. Has anyone got some final comments before Mr. Anand sums up? I think Cedric has his hand up. Cedric. Yes, all right. Thank you, Mr. Anand, for this wonderful discussion. Uh, to sum up, I'd just like to talk about the role of the government and government policies. Uh, I don't think governments are expected to absorb uh, the whole uh, problem of youth unemployment uh, within the public sector. Uh, but their main role is basically to remove the obstacles, the bureaucratic obstacles, and create the and provide the infrastructure, along with creating the right environment for young people to do what they do best, to allow young people to do that. Uh, and this includes also the political and security environment, which in many countries 
affects economies directly and also does not allow young people to prosper within their uh, new ventures and ideas. <clears throat> Thank you, Cedric. Michael, I think, has his hand up. Okay, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Anand and everyone for hosting us here today. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, I agree with Cedric where let's not put all the blame on governments and businesses and let us youth reflect on what we can do in order to make ourselves more competitive and more employable and that would mean us being a little bit more driven, a little bit more motivated and a little bit more aware of opportunities and platforms that are already in existence today that would help us to be more employable. I have been very fortunate to be connected with One Young World. They provide a lot of opportunities for young leaders. Right now, my challenge is why aren't more young leaders or aspiring young leaders leveraging, connecting with other like-minded individuals through that platform? So I think it's good to recognize weaknesses in governments and businesses, but let us youth reflect on what we can do for ourselves, for our peers, to enhance our employability and create a better future. Terrific. Terrific. Oh, Michael. Who, uh, Matthew, you want to go next? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can probably just follow on from that point. I mean, I, I wouldn't take necessarily the same view to say what can we do to become more competitive, productive, and ultimately more profitable to the people that we're employing. Um, I would, however, say that we're basing that on the fact that in, in our country we work, work more overtime hours than any other country in Europe. I mean, we there is there is more 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 unequal as society gets, and more mental health problems exist amongst the population, um, and uh, the more kind of more sort of social imbalances, prison um, prison internment trips, um, and various things come about. So, what I would say as a as a closing remark is. Uh, we can really, we can solve this economic crisis in youth unemployment, but we're going to have to see our democratic institutions as ultimately the drivers of change. Um, I would look at something in our country, the, uh, a drive towards a million green jobs, investing in infrastructure. Um, oh, we are still there, sorry, our video is gone. I would probably be I'd looking at kind of completely relaxing the quite stringent labor, labor union laws, which is existing in many Western European countries, has been there, there since the beginning of, ne of neoliberalism in the early 1980s and late 70s. Um, I will be enshrining in international law things like living wages because if we, unless we get we push the state as a very, very starting point before we even start to take on like root cause issues of. Of you find employment and within within capitalism itself, um, if we, if we can do those things, give people a chance when there's been such a huge transfer of wealth from the poor of poor to the rich over the last five years, then I think we can start to start to really see a recovery and start to see a much more democratic future as well. I think for all of us. Thank you very much. Yes, Sarah. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Anand, and everybody for hosting us here today. It's been a wonderful experience. Um, I just wanted to say that I think that this challenge of youth unemployment is something that's going to take a longer-term investment from a variety of um, stakeholders in it. So it's, it's not just going to be an issue that we need to bring up with governments, but it's also an issue that needs to be addressed by private sector companies, by educational institutions, by nonprofit organizations working in this area, and by the youth themselves. And so I think that the important thing is for people to be thinking about how we can combine all of these elements to create a more holistic solution to the problem. And that will happen over the longer term as well, rather than coming up with short term projects and, pro and programs that might address this issue. It'll be something that re will require the input of a number of people and stakeholders across the world over the long term to really address. Um, Wycliffe, did I see your hand up? Just Wycliffe? Yes, I'm here. Um, I think, th uh, first I want to thank Mr. Nan for his time and for his insights and for actually uh, putting this up, David, as well. I want to say that uh, youth unemployment is something that actually a solution can be found and again it's, it's, it's not going to be a quick fix. Uh, many stakeholders will have to be involved, a lot of resources are going to be uh, to have to be put into place. The education system is also 
also needs to be we are losing you, Wycliffe. Wycliffe will lose again you. because oh, he's back. Uh, if universities and even schools, exist, so yes, seeking jobs is good, but also create uh, developing to be job creators. Am I still there? Yes, we can hear you. Oh no, can we you have lost now? you again. Continue, can continue. We can hear you, Wycliffe. So carry on. Great. Oh. Yes, so I was actually summarizing, I was saying uh, various stakeholders, just like as my, my, uh, my previous colleagues have said, are going to, to be required to put a concerted effort into creating solutions to this unemployment. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Anand, maybe you would like to give us your closing remarks. Okay, let me uh, thank all of you who have participated uh, in this uh, session and all those online who have tuned in, and also our great moderator, David. But let me say that we've all learned a lot uh, this afternoon. You've made it clear that the young people are ready to, uh, to accept the challenge and help create jobs, strengthen the economy. They are challenging governments to make sure they have the right incentives in place. They create a right environment and the supporting systems that will allow them to play their role. They are not asking government to do everything. And they also expect the private sector to play a role. And uh, the private sector, civil society, corporations can either work separately or in harmony to make sure that we create the e economy and the jobs that are necessary to, uh, for the young people to remain productive. But let me also say that youth unemployment is not a problem for the youth alone. It's a problem for all of us, for entire society. And uh, it is a problem for future safety nets. As you know, uh, in many countries, pension schemes rely on new workers coming on stream. You know, you look at some corporations, uh, uh, some say for every one person on retirement, you probably need about six or 10 people working to be able to carry them. If we destroy the employment base, we are also weakening the uh, pension and the safety net system. And we need to think through how we cope with that issue. We've also raised a, a need for educational institutions to take this issue seriously and come up with suggestions as to how societies can cope with youth unemployment. But I'm also walking away from here with uh, much encourage because you haven't lost hope. You are enthusiastic. You feel there can be solutions. And some of you are already engaged in uh, working with some of these solutions. So all that I would want to say to you is, it's wonderful talking to you. I'd love your spirit and approach and keep it up. So have a, a, a good day. And uh, we'll probably meet later in the year if uh, David uh, does what he's promised. <laughs> we, we, will, we will do that. We will all be at One Young World in Johannesburg. So I wanted to thank Mr. Anand, amazing, inspirational, and very smart, wise words as ever. Uh, to thank our brilliant young people, Milenko, Cedric, Matthew, Esther, Sarah, Wycliffe, Lutheran, and Michael. Um, to thank also Ruth and Catherine at the Kofi Annan Foundation, who do a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen, the IT, ITU team in Geneva, and then Stuart Lees and Eamon here in Cannes. Uh, you also uh, have a, a big hi from uh, Bob Geldof, who was here early on this week, oh, yes. to talk about how business needs to create much more meaning uh, and, around meaningful brands and talking about how three quarters of the brands in the world, if they disappeared, people would not care. And I think that's, that's a, big, a big call out to, to business for the opportunity to engage and drive employment for young people. Uh, and so on that note, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure moderating. And the next Pokemon Dialogue will be live on 
the 18th of July, and the topic is an equally interesting one. It's democracy and elections. So thank you very much, Mr. Anand, and thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Thank you, David.